test is in four sections. Now turn to section one. Section one, you will hear a conversation between a man and a woman as the woman changes her family's hotel reservation. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example. This time only the conversation relating to this will be played first. The Sutherland Hotel, Jake speaking. How can I help you? Hello, my name is Mrs. Jane Easton. I have a reservation with you for next week, but I'd like to make a change. Okay, do you have the reservation number with you? Yes, it's EZT 486978. So, 978 is the correct answer. Now the full test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to five. The Sutherland Hotel, Jake speaking. How can I help you? Hello, my name is Mrs. Jane Easton. I have a reservation with you for next week, but I'd like to make a change. Okay, do you have the reservation number with you? Yes, it's EZT 486978. Okay, I have your details here. I just need to take some details from you in order to confirm your identity. First of all, can you tell me your full name again? It's Mrs. Jane Easton. Easton is spelled E-A-S-T-O-N. And can I have your full address, including the postcode? It's 30 Richmond Rise, Birkdale, Auckland. The postcode is 0626. And can I have your date of birth, please? It's the 14th October, 1985. Now, there's a couple of things missing from the reservation details. Can I ask you about them quickly, please? Yes, of course. How did you find out about us? I found you in an internet search. What website did you use? It was Hotels.com. I always use this website when I'm looking for hotels. Yes, we get a lot of bookings from that website. They're very good. I have never had a bad experience using them. And do you know if the website charged you a commission for getting you the booking with us? No. It was clear from the start that they only received that from you. I paid nothing to them. Thanks very much. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. That's lovely, Mrs Easton. Now, what can I do for you? You said you needed to change your reservation. Let me know what needs to be done and I'll make the changes and confirm everything by email. Thank you. At present, I have a reservation for myself and my husband, Michael. We've decided that we're going to bring our children with us now. That's no problem. Can you give me the details of them with our ages? There are two of them. Both boys. Mark is 13 and Max is 8. Would you like separate rooms for the boys? No, just one twin room is fine for them both. Now, you and your husband have a sea view. Do you want that for your children's room? A sea view is more expensive, of course. No, we don't need a sea view for them. They'll just be sleeping there. Is there anything else? Yes, I need to change the dates. At present, we're coming on Friday the 22nd of May. As we're bringing the children, we won't be able to get to you until the following day. We plan to stay until the following Wednesday, and we won't change that. So, I just need to add the extra room for the boys and take off one day from the start of the booking. That's right. Can you let me know the new price? Let me look. You and your husband's price is one day cheaper. For the boys, Mark gets charged a full rate, 
but Max gets the child rate. Your old price was $1,200 and the new one is $2,000 exactly. That includes all the local and district taxes. Can I get a receipt for that? I can't do that for you now, but of course you'll be issued one when at the hotel. I think that's everything then. Okay, Mrs. Peters, let me just check everything. So, the booking is held with your visa card with the last four numbers 8537. Is that still all right? Yes. That's fine. Do I need to add to the deposit I've paid? No, what you've paid already is fine. Will the hotel know that I've paid it? Oh, yes. Don't worry about that. It's all in the system. Now, as I said earlier, I'll send you a confirmation by email. I have your address already in the system. Now, is there anything else? Actually, yes. I've just thought of something. Is breakfast included for everyone? Yes, you all get that included in the price. Anything else? No, I think that's everything. Thanks very much for your help. You're welcome. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2, you will hear a man giving some people information about a tour of a chocolate factory. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the information talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone. My name's Marcus, and I've been asked to tell you a little bit about tours around our chocolate factory. The chocolate factory has always been a family business, and it was constructed in 1924. We found there was a demand for guided tours a few years ago, as our brand is so well known that people want to have a look at how we operate here. The factory does not operate 24 hours a day. It has done in the past, but it's not needed right now. The factory employs 25 people full time. This includes the operating and maintenance staff who are responsible for making the chocolate and the office staff who are responsible for marketing, finance, and all other aspects of our business. I'll now tell you what you see when you come on a tour. We meet in the reception area of the administration area. Here, you will be given some orientation, a visitor's badge, and a sterile hairnet that must be worn in the manufacturing area so that we keep in line with our hygiene policy. There will also be a short safety talk by our health and safety officer. The tour starts with seeing where the raw chocolate arrives. We don't refine the raw material from the cacao bean. The raw chocolate is melted down in enormous vats. Depending on which product is being manufactured, different ingredients are blended. These include milk, sugar, lecithin, which is an emulsifier, vanilla, cinnamon, fruits, and nuts and chili, as well as others. Every time we change the product, the vats must be thoroughly cleaned, especially if we've been using chili. The manufacturing machinery creates the different shapes of the product, and you'll see whatever product is being manufactured at the time of your visit. Finally, the last part of the manufacturing process is the wrapping. We use a foil and paper combination in two pieces, which is done on a horizontal flow wrapping machine. Foil is necessary to stop greasy cocoa butter getting from the inside of the package to the outside, and the paper, of course, is branded on the outside to look attractive. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen to the rest of the information talk and answer questions 16 to 20. After the manufacturing process, you will return to the administration area. You will get to watch a film on the history of chocolate, and then there will be a short lecture that goes through the marketing and sales strategies of our firm. Of course, we don't give away any of our secrets. At the end of the visit, you will of course get a tasting. All of our products will be available to taste, and your guide will assist you in choosing a selection. We recommend, especially with children, that you don't eat too much, as well as being too unhealthy. Your bodies are not usually ready for so much rich food, and it can upset your stomachs. So let me run through some administration for you. First of all, for individuals and small groups, we have one tour in the morning, starting at 10 a.m., and one in the afternoon, starting at 2 p.m. For these tours, adults pay $13, senior citizens pay $9, and children pay $6. Of course, we run larger groups and school tours as well. The usual fees apply except for school tours. Children cost $4 each, and for every seven children, there must be one member of the school staff. There's no charge for the staff. All our guides, by the way, have police screening for working with children. Larger tours can take place at any time during the day, though of course they must be booked in advance. We have free parking for cars and coaches, and the whole factory is wheelchair friendly. Guide dogs are welcome, except in the manufacturing areas, for obvious reasons. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three, you will hear two students discussing a course change with their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Professor Holden, do you have a minute? Yes, come in, both of you. What can I do for you? We wanted to ask you about changing courses. Ah, well, sit down for a while then. So, you two are studying history at the moment, is that right? That's right. And why do you want to change? Well, you know how in the first year we had to study three different subjects, one of which was our main one? Yes, that's our way of making sure that you get a broader education. You can also have the chance to see if a different subject might suit you better. That's what's happened to me. In my first year I studied history, French and linguistics. Now it's the start of the second year and I found that it's the linguistics that I really miss. History is great but I found that there were too many periods to study that I'm just not interested in. Have you talked to any of the history department about this? Have you found out all the syllabus for the next two years? Yes, I've spoken to the head of department and got the whole schedule. I also spoke to the course secretary and some of the lecturers. Do you know that in years two and three, you don't need to study everything? You can choose the periods that you find more interesting. Yes, I know. The course secretary went through everything with me very carefully. The problem is that year three has most of the specialisation, and even then I'll have too many obligatory topics. What about you, Edward? Well, I studied history, English and earth sciences. I chose earth sciences as I wanted one subject that would be really different to what I was used to. I was really good at sciences at school, so I didn't find it difficult at all. So. Is this what you want to study now? 
Or is it English? I love the English and the history, but I can't handle all the essays in both subjects. Yes, I understand that. But are you sure that you will handle the change of choice from a main subject in the arts to one that is so different in the sciences? I've thought about this all summer. I know it's a big switch, but I've done some extra reading over the summer and I've talked it over with my family. Have you spoken to any of the Earth Sciences Department about it? Oh, yes. I spoke to a lot of the teachers and they asked me about my education background. They seemed to be satisfied that I could cope. I'm not so sure. Well, I can't ever be totally sure, but it's what I really want to do. I know it'll be hard work. Earth Sciences has more lectures, but the major assessments are smaller assignments and projects. The exams are shorter too. You now have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 26 to 30. In order to change, there is a certain amount of paperwork. Both of you need, first of all, to fill in this form. You need to put the main subject you're studying and the subject that you want to study. You'll need some signatures on it too. Whose do we need, Professor Holden? You'll need your personal tutor's signature. For you, Tina, that's me, of course, but I don't know for Edward. I'm not his tutor. It's Dr. Flynn. OK, now you'll need as well the signatures of the head of department of the subject to which you're transferring. For you, Edward, you want to switch to Earth Sciences, don't you? That's right. Mr. Thomas is the head of Earth Sciences. That's true, but he's not the head of University Science, who is the person you'll need. That's Professor Atkins. She's very busy, but if you give the form to Mr. Morton, her PA, you'll make sure the form gets signed and back to you quickly. For Tina, your new HOD will be Professor Coles. OK. Finally, you'll both need the signature of the director. You'll need to get Miss Morgan's signature for that. Dr. Tennant is on long-term sick leave, and Miss Morgan is his short-term fill-in. And do we need the signature from the department that we're leaving? The HOD for history is Professor Evans, but he'll hear about it through normal channels. He doesn't need to take part in this process. OK, thanks. Now, do you know what to do with these forms once you have all the signatures? No, can't we just give it to you? You can come and ask me any questions, but don't leave the finished form with me. You need to take the form to the registrar's office. Can we email it? I know scanning and emailing is a lot easier, but the registrar's office will need the original. What about post, then? Posting is fine. However, that might delay things. These kinds of changes can only be done quite near the start of the second year. If your paper gets lost in the post or stuck over a weekend, it might not work for you. OK. How do we go there, then? Go down to the railway station. Go past it, and on the right will be the University Administrative Building. It faces the post office. Go to the second floor and ask if the registrar's office is open. It is often closed. If they tell you it's open, go up a floor to where it is and deliver your form. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four, you will hear part of a geography lecture on Australia's great artesian basin. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this geography lecture. Occupying an area of over 1.7 million square kilometers beneath the arid and semi-arid parts of Queensland, New South Wales, South Australia, and the Northern Territory, the Great Artesian Basin covers almost a quarter of the Australian continent and contains enough water to cover the world over. Much remains to be known about this valuable resource that has enabled life in inland Australia to develop over thousands of years. To explain how the Great Artesian Basin works, you need to know how it came to exist in the first place. Back in the Triassic Age, Australia was joined together with the other southern continents, including Antarctica, South America, Africa, and New Zealand, in a landmass called Gondwana. Right up in the northwest corner of Gondwana, there was a natural dip that became the Great Artesian Basin. Over the next 100 million years, huge events like ice ages in Europe and tectonic plate movements caused the ocean level to rise and fall. When the ocean levels rose, water became trapped in that natural dip and formed a sea. But when the ocean levels fell, the whole area became land again. When the seas drained away, they left clay deposits behind, which hardened into impermeable stone strata. These stone strata residues became the environment that allowed the formation of the Great Artesian Basin. Below ground level, where the ancient natural dip lies today, there is a layer of permeable stone allowing falling rain to seep through it. When there is no impermeable stone, the water soaks down until it reaches the saturation level which is where the rock ends and the water reservoir of the basin begins. The water in the reservoir is then held between two impermeable stone strata. This water is incredibly pure, as it has been filtered and cleaned as it passed from the permeable rock. The water then remains trapped under the ground, only emerging through a natural spring. Scientists estimate that there's over 65,000 million megaliters of water in the basin right now. A megaliter is a million liters. 60,000 million megaliters would be enough to cover all the land on the planet in almost half a meter of water. The water fortunately does not stay underground. For thousands and thousands of years, artesian water has been bubbling up to the surface all over the basin area. This brings life to parts of Australia that would otherwise be barren desert. These areas are home to a host of native plant and animal species that have evolved in these unusual ecosystems. Many of these can't be found anywhere else in the world. What's more, water from the basin springs around the recharge zones often seeps into natural creek and river systems, helping to keep them flowing when the rains don't come. Of course, not all the emerging water comes from natural escape. Farmers, town councils, and others all create boreholes to make artesian wells, and these have helped maintain agriculture and urbanization that wouldn't have been otherwise possible. The trouble is that modern usage of the basin's water has caused the great artesian basin problems. It's so bad that a lot of bores and natural springs have simply stopped flowing, and hundreds of bores that do flow are out of control. They can't be turned off, and they're wasting millions of liters of water every day. A lot of bore water flows into shallow channels dug into the dirt, which encourage noxious weeds and feral animals, and it's almost pointless, because the open channels, or drains, mean around 95% of the water evaporates or seeps away before it can even be used. 
Meanwhile, to make matters worse, a lot of old bores were poorly made, or the casings underground are corroding, so the water is escaping to the wrong places and damaging the environment. There are, however, things we can do. These days, there's a strategy in place to fix up the old bores so they can be used in a sustainable way, and the water can be distributed more responsibly. This process involves what we call capping and piping. Put simply, capping is just like putting a lid on the bores. Through a tap system, farmers can turn the bores on and off, and only use the water when it's needed. Piping involves replacing the old open channels or drains with new piping. Although this is a lengthy and expensive process, it is regarded as one of the best ways to preserve a lot of the water that is needlessly lost. Government funding has allowed the process of piping to be carried out for a number of years now, and, because of this, the water goes straight to tanks without being wasted, and it doesn't ruin the native landscape by encouraging weeds and feral animals. This effort to make the water usage is vital. The Great Artesian Basin is key to life to about a quarter of the country, but it also impacts Australians from coast to coast. In fact, it impacts the country so much that if it was to dry up, Australia would be a very different place. Seventy towns that still rely on the basin for their water would disappear. The beef, wool, and sheep industries would lose about one billion Australian dollars a year, and the food production system would be affected very badly. Australia would have to import more food, and the balance of payments would change, affecting the country's economy as a whole. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of this listening test. Now you can check your answers. Please click like and subscribe us. I wish you all the very best.